Good morning or good afternoon, even uh, probably good evening, everyone. My name is Nazareno Pierdicca. Some of you knows me as a Mauro, but okay, same same person. Um, I am the chair of the Modeling Remote Sensing Technical Committee of the GRSS, Geoscience and Remote Sensing Society. And uh, okay, and now we have uh, a new webinar in the frame of the MIRS uh, activity that will be given by Professor Mehmet Kurum of the University of Georgia. Uh, I, of course, uh, uh, thanks a lot, uh, uh, Mehmet, to be available to give this webinar uh, that is uh, about a very interesting uh, new topic uh, that is uh, GNSS uh, transmissometry. Uh, and uh, OK, um, thank you again, uh, Mehmet, for, uh, for this seminar. Uh, as uh, you probably already know, uh, this seminar is uh, registered and it will be made available uh, sometime uh, uh, in YouTube, right, Fairuz? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, absolutely. After a few days in the YouTube channel of GSF. Okay, very good. So, uh, Mehmet, I, I think you can introduce yourself, but probably many people uh, in this room uh, already uh, know you quite well at least from your uh, papers and your uh, and your work but if you want uh, you can start so we have about uh, i don't know mehmet if you are planning 30 40 minutes uh, at 40 minutes yeah okay and then probably another 10 20 minutes for question or oh, okay. any discussion okay so uh, I think uh, you can start. Uh, as oh, you sounds prefer. Good. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Mehmet Kurum. I'm associate professor at uh, uh, University of Georgia School of Electrical and Computer Engineering. Uh, prior to uh, University of Georgia, I was at Mississippi State University about seven years. Um, today, uh, I'll be talking about um, GNSS transmissometry. Um, for remote sensing uh, force canopy water content. Um, I'll try to highlight the potentials, challenges, and pathways to the solutions. And I uh, would like to acknowledge uh, my students and postdocs work in our lab, Dylan Boyd, uh, Mehdi Ferhad, Abesh Ghosh, Esan Hogg, and Suresh Yadav. So lots of the slides that I'm going to show you is really produced with these students. All right, here is the first, uh, before I starting, I just wanna give a disclaimer. Um, so there will be a lot of questions and answers in this presentation. I will try to propose some pathways, possible solutions. I think the, the prerequisite for a, conducting a meaningful research is asking the right questions. Hopefully I'll try to ask the right questions. And at the end of the presentation, I'd like to trigger fruit, fruitful discussion to see how we can utilize this uh, Genesis T, how we can maximize the potential. All right, here is the outline. So it has two parts. In the first part, uh, I'll be talking about what is Genesis T and what do we measure and why do we measure and what are the research gaps and how do we address these research gaps? What are the research questions? I'll try to give that introduction in the first part. In the second part, I'm gonna give specific examples. Um, mobile Genesis the experiment that we did uh, about uh, two, three years ago, a SMAPVAX field campaign. And also we're looking at the relationship between the LIDAR and Genesis T. I'll uh, give you some you know, you know, preliminary result on that. And then um, I'll briefly talk about radio realistic forest scene generation uh, how to address or how to answer these questions. And some of them is answered, but lots of them still wait to be answered. Uh, the video that you see on the right is, is collected by a smartphone attached to the uh, helmet system on a gimbal like you're seeing over here. And it just give you a perspective like what we're trying to measure visually uh, as we walk under the, the forest canopy. And then we have different uh, platforms over the years that we utilize, which I'll talk briefly as we continue. 
first let's just start motivation like let's just see why we're we doing uh, this research uh, you know to start with um, the vegetation optical depth is is a measure of how much uh, vegetation water content attenuates the microwave signals and and the goal is really get the vegetation water content um, and it, it provides the opportunity to get that information however the vod itself which i'll define in the coming slides is a function of uh, tree architecture and also configuration parameters. So it poses some challenges uh, to get the vegetation water content out of the VOD. But if you have the vegetation water content, if you solve this problem, if you have the vegetation water content, it will be useful. Uh, it's a useful measure for water status. It's directly linked to the moisture content of living quail. Um, and it's important to predict perhaps to understand the uh, wildfire risk. And also, you can use this information, vegetation water content, hydrological and ecological process, and do more, you know, do data assimilation and, and predictions. Uh, currently, um, there are uh, VOD products available, uh, uh, you know, uh, globally, uh, using opportunistically using this map or SMAS data or even MCRE data. Um, so we have VOD products. But uh, also validating these beauty products is, is quite difficult uh, because it, there's lack of uh, available institute data sets, you know, how to validate them. And also the footprints are very large. Uh, traditionally, how do we characterize the trees? Um, the most traditional one is destructive sampling. You cut the uh, tree and you measure all the dimension and also even you weight the, uh, the woody, uh, materials and then try to get the vegetation water content or you may have you can use like the corner reflectors if you have a radar uh, you can use the corner reflector and try to get estimate the also attenuation or the VOD as well and you can feed this uh, structural information into discrete scatter models and you can also estimate uh, VOD from from there as well so this is you know traditionally how we have been doing this sort of work um, and then GNSS transmissometry is a is a sort of new way of doing it. Um, and the way it works is uh, you have to have two uh, measurements simultaneously. One measurement is in the open area. Uh, there's no obstruction. The second one is under the canopy. Uh, and it could be on a stationary unit, like here you see on the screen, or it could be put on a mobile unit uh, as well. Uh, but if you take the, the ratio of the measurements uh, under the sub under the forest to the reference, uh, it's approximately equal to transmissivity, and there are some errors associated with that, which I'll talk. But you you basically estimate the transmissivity from this ratio, assuming that what you measure is attenuated direct signal under the canopy, and then using this simple relationship right here, you you get the VOD from here. Um, and and like I mentioned, there are two uh, setups that you might have. One setup is you may have a, a stationary receiver under the canopy, and then you can observe over a very long time. Uh, it's sort of like the point scale. Or the second option is you put on a mobile platform and uh, you know just to tra traverse the, um, the forest uh, and then try to sample it. Uh, of course, there are advantage and disadvantage advantage, uh, among these techniques. Uh, if you have a, a point scale measurement, and you know you will have uh, get more insights into the temporal changes in the vegetation water content, but if you have um, you know mobile unit, so you're traveling it, you're sampling you know larger areas, so you get a short term uh, spatial uh, information at a landscape scale. Landscape scale, what I mean is maybe it's less than a kilometer. Um, and it, it can average the heterogeneity and probably gonna help you to solve uh, dynamics linked to the, the soil uh, water dynamics. Uh, these are the two current approach currently, uh, how we sample the forest. Uh, just looking at the literature, it's not really comprehensive uh, summer here, uh, just a few of those that I put it here. Um, and it you know, just goes back to 2011. And you can see that a different type of receivers, some of them are custom built receivers collecting the raw IF, some of them using smartphones or server grade uh, receivers or um, you know, off the shelf, you know, low cost. 
and they have different polarization choices uh, as well. And most of them have reference, uh, reference like outside of the forest. And also most of them are stationary. Um, so mainly in this talk, I'll be more focusing on the, the mobile uh, unit that we developed over the past couple of years. First, let's define you know, what we're measuring. Uh, and then I'll try to highlight uh, these re you know, research questions. So we have this reference signal, um, which is given right there. There's a K, uh, which is a constant. And then you have the antenna gain right there. Uh, and then the, the subcanopy measurements, you have the same common constant, which is related to uh, ERRP, you know, distance to the satellites, wavelength, et cetera. And uh, that common constant multiplied by the transmissivity, the gain of your receive antenna under the canopy, and there could be a multiple scattering happening. So these are the observations, like you can see here, uh, there are common terms here, uh, antenna gain, if you use it, that's what we do. We wanna use the same antenna uh, and same receiver system. So these are the commons, and also this constant is common. And transmissivity is what we're trying to estimate. And multiple scattering is something it's trying to um, you know, modify the signal. Um, and when we take the ratio of these two, these common factors cancels out and a residual term remains. So this resi residual term uh, depends on the multiple scattering and depends on the polarization, depends on the angle and the structure of the, the canopy as well. If you assume that the we that residual term is, is small or negligible, then you get the transmissivity. And again, from that, you get the vegetation optical depth, tau value. But still, you have to go from tau to vegetation water content. Um, you know, usually uh, that's what we expect to see and what we observe in the past as well. It's proportional. So more vegetation water content, higher the VOD. And there's a proportionality constant here. So these are the two um, uh, parameters that needs to be uh, you know, quantified. I call them research gaps. So we have some knowledge for agricultural fields of similar terms exist, but not forest. So we're not really, we don't have the, the full knowledge about uh, these parameters. So what we wanna do is we want to really quantify this residual term to understand better the factors affecting our measurements. And also we would, would like to understand this proportionality constant so that we convert our VOD to vegetation water content. And like I mentioned, uh, these depends on polarization, observation angle, and kind of architecture, and might be depending on the ground as well. Uh, just look at it a little bit detail for all each factors. One of them is the polarization. Uh, so the transmit signal is GPS signals or GNSS signals, majority is right-hand circle polarized. Your receiver could be you know, linear, uh, uh, I'm sorry, left-hand circle polarized or right-hand circle polarized, linear polarized, so there are different choices. So how does the receiver polarization choice impact the measurements? So you know, what, what, how does the, the wave propagate if you have left-hand circle polarized receiver or right-hand or linear polarized receiver? And how much you know, incoming signal is the right-hand circle polarized, but how much it gets depolarized as it propagates through the canopy? Uh, should we use dual polarized antenna or single polarized antenna? What will be the benefit if you use dual polarized antenna? Um, and also, um, when you measure the VOD, since the incoming is right-hand circle polarized, what you measure is either right-right, right-left, or right-linear polarized. However, if you want to compare this with the microwave diameters, they're measuring linear polarized, either horizontal or vertical. So how does this GNSST VOD estimates are related to this radiometric passive VOD is something we still uh, not fully understood. And also, you know, VOD is used in SAR, in backscatter configuration. So how does this GNSST VOD is related to SAR VOD, either drive or use in the backscatter case. So these are the, some questions that uh, we still need to work on and understand. And the observation angle is another one. So the, the, the polar uh, sky plot that you're seeing on the right is, is showing you four major Genesis constellations at a given time and position. You can see 
that quite a bit transmitted exist um, almost anywhere on Earth. Um, you can say about like 30 or more uh, satellites available. So this is a huge capacity. And due to this diversity, you can see there are different uh, elevation and azimuth angles. And because of this diversity, one can scan almost this upper hemisphere uh, using this, this information. And these satellites are also moving. So it helps you to really scan it uh, almost like this upper hemisphere as well. That's the opportunity. But the challenge is, um, you know, they have the angle will be varying, and how our measurements are angle dependent. And you expect to that uh, expect that uh, our measurements are angle dependent, but how those are depend on the angle needs to be quantified. And also, it's going to be you know impact our you know the sensing uh, zone uh, or uh, the area that we sensing the trees. Depending on the elevation angle, uh, that zone will be either small or large. It will be a function of angle. Um, so the question is, how does the view estimate vary as a function of angle? And this is something we still uh, want to explore. Another uh, complication is the, the canopy architecture. And I'll talk a little bit later uh, in the coming slides, but the, the, the figure that you're seeing on the right panel is one of the measurements that we did. The blue one is the open area measurements. And then the, the green one is um, uh, our measurement every second. So we integrate the signal every one second. And red one is the average using the moving average. Um, but you can see there's quite a bit variation. And this is an indication of multiple scattering. And it's indication of there's you know three gaps and three uh, densities are varying, the heights are varying and all that. Uh, and this is a moving platform which I'll talk in the coming slides. Uh, but we want to understand this source, source of these rapid variations. And also, um, you know, which, what is the best geophysical uh, metrics that, that describes the view of it? Is the woody volume, crown diameter, shape of the crown, or plant area density, or maybe other parameters are more sensitive to the view of it. So that was, this is something we want to understand too. And what vegetation layers contribute to the measurements? Uh, is it upper, middle, lower, like depending on the vegetation type? So it, it's gonna impact like what we are sampling with this. Uh, it, it's gonna, um, will depend on what layers of the vegetation is contributing most. And, you know, what are the dominant scatters that impact the measurement, leaves, branch, trunks, or, you know, a combination of those. And the, the bottom, you see a LiDAR image, which I'll, I'll show you in the coming slide, explain, you can get some more insights. All right, now uh, I'm gonna go into uh, specific examples. Uh, one is the, the mobile GNSST deployment that we did back in uh, 2020, right before the COVID. And I'm gonna give you some first results on that. Um, in this experiment, uh, we use smartphones and uh, off the shelf, uh, receiver is called u blocks. Uh, the left that you see the experimental matrix. So we have experiments, and like I said, right before the COVID, uh, February 2nd, 2020, and then we have experiment 2021. What we did is um, we want to, we had two things that we want to understand. One is the consistency of these measurements, since we have two uh, instruments. So we want to make sure they're consistent. And second thing that we want to understand is. Uh, what's the impact of the ground multipath? Because we're going to put on a rover and we'll be traveling. We don't want to sample the ground. We want to sample the forest. So we want to understand that as well. So we did special experiments uh, in, uh, like you can see, we put absorbers on the floor, forest floor, or, uh, you know, on the open area to understand the impact of the multipath. And also we use different sizes of uh, ground plates, um, which helps to, to block the signal. Uh, as well. And then finally, once we understood those, which I'll give you the examples, then we deploy the system on a mobile unit and then we collect the data um, in different um, months uh, from March to June and every month only once and try to get the seasonal variation. Uh, here is, this is a little bit crowded, but uh, this is a really important, uh, you know, conclusion that we have here. The first column that you're seeing right here First, we want to make sure uh, our receivers behave the same. So we repeated the experiment in two different days and using two different phones with the same model. 
and we try we got almost exact same results. So this gives us confidence that we have same phone, um, same configuration, two different days, we can get the same results or and simultaneously we can collect data. Um, that's the consistent. The second thing that we look at it, uh, we put um, you know, we changed the, the size of the, the ground plate. Uh, we use 12 inch and 18 inch. The top one that you're seeing here is done in the open area. By changing the, the size of the ground plate, you can see the multipad, these black and the red are the, the signal strengths and the blue is the, the elevation angle. You can see that the, the signal strength is, is changing quite a bit by changing the, um, uh, the plate size which is sort of expected. When you look at the forest, you virtually get the same results, no matter if it's a 12 inch or 18 inch, uh, um, you know, the plate. This is an indication that, that there is not much grunt multipad is coming, but we want to verify further. And then we cover the, the floor uh, with observers. And, and you can see the, the third column, uh, in the open area with observer and without observer, you can see a difference because observer is, is blocking the signals. So you can see the impact of the multipad, but you can see on the bottom, like the F figure F here, uh, virtually not much change uh, by covering the floor with the, um, the observers. So basically this empirically we demonstrated here that the, the mobile forest unit, the receiver, is effectively sampling the forest canopy rather than the ground. This is what we want to see it because our receiver will be traveling, uh, you know, under the forest. We want to sample the forest. Uh, so this is a, a empirical result that that give us confidence that we're measuring the vegetation. And then, like I mentioned, we uh, did, uh, you know, we placed the receiver uh, on a rover, and then we did uh, experiment. Uh, like this is the experimental side. Uh, with, with different type of forests, the oak mi mixed forest and the pine forest. And at four different uh, months, uh, March, April, May, and June, we want to understand how our measurements are, are impacted by the seasonal change in the trees. And the figure left, top left that you're seeing right here is uh, the first four box plot is the oak trees. And you can see a, there's a clear increase in the VOD values going from March to June. And the same trend is, is apparent for the pine and mixed trees as well. Uh, so this is another way of demonstrating that the, you know, we are sampling the vegetation, not the ground, and it is sensitive to the seasonal variations. All right, after this successful you know, demonstration of the mobile methodology, then we join uh, SMAPVAX field campaign. Uh, the goal here is you know, SMAP has a large footprint, uh, about 36 kilometer by 36 kilometer. Uh, and currently SMAP team is interested in uh, soil moisture retrieval in the, the forested regions. And uh, uh, there are two sites, Massachusetts and Millbrook. These are New York and Massachusetts. And there are uh, stations uh, in this footprint. They're collecting soil moisture and there is intensive uh, data collections happen. So what we did is we joined uh, the experiment with our robotic system and collected uh, GNSS data uh, and, and to get the vegetation uh, VOD information uh, for SMAP uh, campaign. Uh, for that one, you can see here, this is an example. Uh, we have collected, we joined the experiment April 28, 50, uh, 25th, 27th, and 28th. Uh, we use helmet system, uh, depending on the, the nature of the field, some, some field were very tough for a robot to go, and some fields are suitable for man to walk in. Uh, so we use two different systems here, and then we also identify open fields uh, in this forested field so that it has kind of give us the reference. Um, again, you have to check consistency uh, of your measurements. So in this SMAP footprints, we located our receivers into two locations right here. Uh, those are the open areas, no forest nearby. Um, and unobstructed, and they're about like 10, 15 kilometers away from each other. And then we collect the data for three days, and you, you can see right here that uh, the signal collected at these two locations over three days is providing almost exact same results. So this is a consistency of our measurements. Another thing is, remember what I showed is the signal has to go through the un receiving antenna, 
since our uh, the receiver in the open area is just put on the floor so that we don't have any ground mount pad. But the receiver, uh, you know, on the uh, mobile unit is uh, we attach to the gimbal and is always oriented in the same direction with the receiver. Um, and to demonstrate that, I'm just going to give you right here uh, that in this video, you can see that the robot is is moving in the forest and doing you know different things and. And you still, you can see that the, the gimbal system is always keeping the, the receiver is, the antenna is on the same direction. This help us to really eliminate this common factor antenna gain. So um, then I'm uh, just gonna give some examples right here. Uh, this is, for example, one of the sites that we travel. So we basically go a random path, we sampling it, and uh, basically we're taking this the difference between this forest measurement from the sky measurements gonna give us a transmissivity approximately. And then we convert that into the VOD. Uh, again, uh, that was, this one is just the one satellite, but like I mentioned, we have almost 30 satellites. So when you combine all of those satellites and it's diverse in angles, uh, you can see that, you know, we get a, a good hemispheric uh, view of the forest, uh, you know, the area that we sampled. And these are some of our results. Uh, for one side, again, we have many sites uh, that we participated in. Um, you know, these are different sites. And these are the average values uh, for those sites. Um, again, uh, the, we are able to get these values using this robotic system around those stations. But the questions remain. So we get the VOD values for each station, but how do we really scale this VOD estimates to the SMAP footprint? Still uh, is a question that we need to work on. Um, but may, perhaps we can utilize airborne LIDAR data and extrapolate this VOD estimates to the entire footprint. This may be the possibility, or maybe you might have more ideas we can talk. Um, now, I'm gonna uh, talk now uh, how, we can, how we can validate our Genesis T with LIDAR and other methodologies. But what are the options? So I'm gonna give some examples from the our matchup with the LIDAR and VOD. The first, let's look at this chart. So we have Genesis T data, which is this ratio, is approximate the transmissivity. And we have a for the SMAP sites, we have airborne and terrestrial LIDAR. And um, from those, you can extract vegetation parameters. Um, such as tree height, crown diameter shape, uh, plant area density, wood volume, and et cetera. And you can um, uh, either directly compare those vegetation parameters with uh, the data, uh, or the number of points you can try to, you know, if you have more vegetation, you have more points, so you can try to correlate that with the Genesis data. Or you have the architectural information, you feed that into the numerical EM models, and try to estimate the, um, the VOD from those, or you can feed that into uh, you know, the first order um, distort born models and then try to model, you know, validate that as well. So there are four different. So in this next coming slides, I'll be showing you the, this is the preliminary results. I'm gonna show you the airborne, uh, how, do we, how it's correlated to the GNSST data. Uh, this is the uh, one of the sites that I'm going to show in here. We're working with all the sites that we collected. So this is the the lidar data uh, that is that was available to us. You can see it's a almost two kilometer by two kilometer area, almost two billion points. And then we cut that area into four hundred meter by four hundred meter. And this black pad is the pad that you know we uh, sample the vegetation with our robotic system. Still two point one million points. It's a lot of points there. Um, so what we measure is the satellites are at different locations. So we two, you know, we're seeing uh, the veget different part of the vegetation depending on where the satellites are, and the signals usually like we define the fennel zones, and we want to identify which part of the zone is contributing most. It's the first, fifth, or tenth, you know, depending on the is a coherent or diffuse scattering or polarization uh, angle. It might be changing. So that's what we're defining. This is our sampling zone. And just to illustrate here, uh, just the four different satellites and it did four different azimuth and elevation angles. And uh, this is just a, not the forest. This is just the random points that we generate just for illustrative purposes. 
And then uh, the points inside those sampling zones, you can see the number of points are really related to uh, their azimuth and elevation locations. And as we are moving, uh, as we move, we are sampling uh, and, and the number of points that I'm showing on the right bottom, you can see it keeps changing depending on where I am sampling. The path here is, is random. But this is the idea, like how we, you know, collecting data in our mobile system. As we move, there are different number, different particles are within our, you know, field of view. We are sampling those. And here's as an example. Uh, say this is our, you know, receivers is at this location, and this is the lidar, actual lidar data, actual location of the receiver, and this is the Fresnel zone in a specific satellite direction. And these yellow dots are those within this Fresnel zones. And since we are moving a, a, along a path, and if we calculate the number of the points, which is this red one, this is showing the number of points, and we have the VOD estimates, which is the blue one, and you can see that they're correlated. I mean, this is sort of like expected, but um, um, uh, still, uh, you know, the, the number of points is not necessarily the best descriptor. Uh, maybe we want to get the vegetation woody content or we want to get, you know, the surface area of those particles. We don't know which one is better quality the VOD, but this is the first result, so very encouraging. And also remember the VOD that we measure, we still have the residual terms, the error associated with that. Still, there is this correlation. It's very, very encouraging. And we're still working on uh, different sites, different satellites and understand this correlation. And also, as I mentioned, there are more, there, uh, the data is more than points because there are architectural information is right there. And basically you can segment the trees uh, the, in the scene and you can work each tree separately. And this is, you see an example tree right here. Basically you can convert those into uh, you know, cylinders, which we use in, in our electromagnetic models. Uh, and then from those, you can get like these vegetation parameters, and then you can try to correlate them uh, with the VOD measurement. So there's some rich information in that LiDAR data. We're still working on trying to exploit and understand the, how uh, the VODs depend on the, the kind of architecture. This is, I'm putting this slide again, just to remind you that the LiDAR data can provide you uh, those architectural information, and you can try to understand the uh, relationship between VOD and those architectural information. That's what we, you know, working on. Now, uh, I'm coming to the near the end of my uh, presentation. Now I want to talk about uh, the modeling. So, um, and I call here the radio realistic, you know, forest that what we all are seeing after. Um, just to understand what we, what I mean by radio realistic forest. So you can see in the literature, there are different type of models are used. Uh, and here from A to D, uh, uh, there are different degree of realism. Uh, when we say realism, it's like the visual realism. So obviously the, the one on the right is visually more appealing. The one on the left is visually less appealing. It just, you know, considering only the, the leaves, not the entire uh, the branches or the trunks. The question still remains, you know, which vegetation or maybe combination of those is the is more radio realistic. What I mean by radio realistic is like the you have the architectural information, but it's the accuracy that you want, and then also the speed that in your calculations. So of course you can get a more uh, photorealistic, uh, you know, the forest. You can do full wave solution, but it's a very expensive, and you can speed it up, but uh, still, uh, you know, it's an expensive process. Or is the question is, do we really need the full wave solution or can we do some quasi full wave solution as well? Um, so for that, I'm just gonna give you an example that's going on in our research group. Uh, this is the distorted born standard uh, you know, model, which is, you know, scatters are floating in, in the layers. Uh, and for that one, you're not able to put the, the gaps information. Uh, but the second one is sort of the quasi uh, structural one is the one that we recently implemented, which means that wherever we are, we're trying to define our sensing volume and we calculate the statistics only for that sensing volume. And then we feed that into the distorted bond and we are able to get the estimated transmissivity. 
And since we only consider the particles within our you know, sensing zone, so it's sort of taking into account the, the gap information. And the other one is, uh, you know, methods of moment, uh, and, and there are methodologies to speed up the, uh, the full wave solutions is also ongoing in our group as well. Uh, just going to give you an example uh, for the, the middle option, which is this option, right, quasi uh, distorted born. I'm just going to give you an example before I conclude my presentation. So here uh, we have we have different, this is artificially generated forest and different locations. So these are the sampling zones. And uh, we are getting the statistics from those. And uh, and then uh, you know we we feed that into the distorted border approximation, and, and then we calculate transmissivity. But also, if you just you know for your sensing zone, if you look at the, just the, uh, the vegetation woody volume at every location, you can see that it's varying. You know the trunk with the volume, primary branch, and other things that you can see it is varying is expected. And we want to see how our measurements are correlated with this woody volume. This is again one of the parameters that we are interested in. And this is an example that we have here. Uh, this is 25 different locations. Um, and, and the figure that you're seeing is, is the angle versus the power ratio. Uh, and right, right circle polarized and right, left circle polarized that you're seeing right there. And, um, and the red one is you just ignore. Uh, all the multiple scattering, it just assume that what you measure is the transmissivity. Blue one is you incorporate all the multiple con contributions. And then the green one is the residual term that I, I mentioned in the earlier part of my presentation. You can see that the residual term has an impact. It's you know, depending on the what polarization we have and what angle we have. In some cases, less impact, some cases more impact. So, you know, this is a parameter that we're trying to understand. Now, if we look at visually, and I'm going to give you the correlations as well, this is the, the vegetation optical depth estimation from the simulated data uh, at different incidence angles, at different locations. And with, this is with the residual term. You can see it, it's sort of like the, the, the you know, uh, disrupt the, the signal um, uh, here. And then if you look at visually the wood volume, like the, there is a relationship between those to uh, estimate, but if you really calculate the, the correlation between the wood volume and vegetation optical depth at different angles, the one on the left is if you ignore the residual term, we have a almost near like 98, 99% you know, correlation. But if you incorporate the uh, residual term, you know, it's a 90%, 75%, you know, depending on what angle we are measuring. And also it depends on what polarization here. Just to illustrate the purpose, I'm just showing the RR polarization. And if you look at the RL or RX, RY, it's going to give you different results. Now, uh, this is the last slide before I finish, uh, is uh, how do we achieve this, you know, radio realistic, you know, scene? The way we imagine, or that's what we're working on right now is, uh, we generate an artificial tree, uh, and then we convert that to the point clots, uh, and then we down sample, down sample the point clots, and then we get the, um, you know, is, there's an algorithm called the Quest, QSM. Uh, we try to simplify to the cylinders, uh, and then we reconstructed trees from the LiDAR data. We try to compare with this actual architecture and see how well it matches the actual architecture, and then feed that into our model. Uh, and then, um, the perturb this this uh, the cylinders like you know you remove some of the cylinders or you know you reduce the the size and then feedback into the model again and repeat it this there's a you know feedback loop here and eventually you want to keep your accuracy and then the uh, the architecture of uh, the tree is is simple enough uh, and eventually uh, what we really want to do is this is everything is going to be done in artificial environment, but eventually with actual LiDAR data come in. So we need to really convert that into a format and suitable for our models to really do simulations. And that format has to be uh, not heavy, uh, like not all the details that, that may not be necessary should not be there. Uh, this is sort of like the exercise right now we currently doing. Let me um, 
you know, conclude my uh, presentation and give some more perspective here. Um, GNSST, uh, either is a stationary or mobile, but I mainly focus here is the uh, mobile version. It's a practical way to sample the forest. So there are still lots of questions to understand what GNSS T measurements mean. Uh, we need radiorealistic electromagnetic models to resolve these research gaps. Uh, and LIDAR seems to be uh, quite powerful to augment GNSS T and EM models and understand these uh, uh, measurements. And also the scaling, the view, the estimates to the large satellite footprints remain a, a research topic as a research topic. topic. With that, uh, I'd like to conclude my presentation. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much, Mehmet. Thank you for your very interesting presentation of a new technique, okay? <laughs> I'm sorry for the robot. <laughs> this uh, is the, the one uh, before we, this is like we got the robot and we're trying to train it. Um, and these tall grasses is, I don't know what it sees it, those tall grasses didn't want to really walk on the tall grasses. So I just fall down. I don't know if you guys know, there's a movie called The Mitchells and Machines. Uh, so this dog, that, that dog that you see is the same entire world because it looks like a loaf of bread. So the, you know, the robots are sort of uh, confused and then they just broke. <laughs> uh, I don't know what they see. Oh, okay, right. poor robot. <laughs> yeah, yeah for... uh, and probably we have some time for a question. Yeah. I'll be or... happy to have questions if you have. Yes, yeah, so again, uh, my like I, I gave the disclaimer at the beginning, I gave more questions than answers. Um, but again, the, the prerequisite for a good research is uh, you know, asking the good questions, so you might have more questions. So I'll be happy to take those. And uh, but there's lots of potential in this methodology. Yes, yes, you have shown this quite clearly. Uh, so uh, we can get more questions in case, or uh, probably other comments or a suggestion yeah. from the audience. You can, uh, uh, Firuz, are you still there? Uh, there is uh, uh, someone who uh, raised uh, his hand, Daniel uh, Firuz. Can yes. I directly uh, enable uh, people to speak or? Uh, Yes, yes, I promoted him as a panelist, so he can just unmute himself and just talk. Okay. Dr. Karum, can you hear me well? Yes, I can hear. Who is talking? Okay. I, I did, I'm enjoying your presentation very much. The question I have for you is, um, it seems to me you mentioned random transits of the robots. Couldn't it really be a very uh, repeatable thing for the robots to transit the exact same paths over and over and over again? That is possible. Um, and then secondly, question is, it seems in a way that maximizing the realisticness of the model might involve a tomographic recreation of the forest, which I believe is beyond my mathematical ability, but I believe you have sufficient information to yes. at least get a first order tomographic representation from the uh, GPS signal attenuations. Am I incorrect on that? Well, the GPS signals, like what we measure is, um, you're not able to really um, get a tomographic information. You're just gonna get a, like a combined information because this one second integration time, whatever is going through the vegetation is all comes in one value so you're not able to discriminate uh from the the gnss measurement itself where that that signal is coming from so that's why we want to use either em models or this lidar data to figure out which portion of the uh the forest is contributing what we're measuring i'm i think that there are uh gns receivers that will allow a interception of the of the radio intensity of each satellite in real time. It does. They're not, yeah, it, they're it, not it, the most cheapest, of course. This would be a more uh, a more sophisticated GNS receiver for developers right. of GNS applications. Yes, you can 
collect multiple satellite data at the same time, uh, even with the low cost receivers and smartphones. Um, but those are like different elevation and azimuth directions. Correct. Uh, but if you want to sample like in the vertical direction, the uh, that ability is not there unless you are, have a fixed location and you know, you're collecting a very long time of specific location, you can do that. Um, mm -hmm. But if you're traveling a you know, random path, and like you said, you can perhaps repeat that random path with the robot and multiple times of the day, uh, you will be able to do that. Um, but if you're just doing one measurement, one, one time, of that oh, path, right. it's just not going to give you that, you know, tomographic information, um, but it's going to give you an average, um, you know, hemispheric information. Yes, very exciting information. You have clearly a, a, a very rich mine of information to to try and uh, research. There are so I many informations to... here. Uh, absolutely, yeah. they just uh, so many capacity is high, and there are a lot of challenges, and that's what we're working on. And, and again, like I said. There are more questions than answers at the moment, but that's the beauty of the research. Thank you for the Thank question. Thank you very much. We have also a question on the chat. How important is it to include the correlations among fields from different scatters in the canopy models, uh, i.e. effects of interference, actually? The question is about the uh, interference among uh, particles. Particles, yeah. Uh, this is a good question. Um, the answer to that question, I don't have the answer to tell right now uh, what it will be, but what I will say is, let me just go here. Um, if you have the, like, the full wave solutions, probably gonna get a better answer to that one because it just, all the, uh, the particles in their right locations, and that might be interaction between, let's say, the large trunk and then the large branch. So you consider that interaction clearly in the full wave. But in the distorted bone, you sort of like uh, assume they're independent from each other, even though you know you can, you can still um, uh, incorporate the exact location, but the interaction is, is ignored uh, in this distorted bone approximation. Um, but again, this is a question like, what is the radio realism? Is this really important? Um, and this is still, you know, we don't know the answers, but that's a good question to, you know, work on. Okay, any other question or comments? Uh, I have one. Uh, it, is, it was not fully clear to me. Uh, which one of the data that we have shown was in uh, right uh, and which one in left? Uh, the, but uh, in, in the in a, simulations, in, also in the data, in the data, because in a previous uh, study that we did on a similar uh, configuration, right. we found that in the uh, right left uh, there is a lot of uh, scattered signal. Mm -hmm. uh, collected by the receiver more than the transmissivity because uh, okay uh, right to left uh, is yeah uh, so what we use is linear polarized so we didn't use right or left we use the linear polarized uh, let me see if i have yeah this result that i show here is all yeah. linear polarized um but again we can repeat similar experiment with right and left together like this is also another question like should we use the right left linear or the combination of these um i know your work uh, uh you have some work on that and you demonstrated some you provided some insights into that uh, for some trees there in, in italy uh, i think we want to expand that to maybe uh, different type of trees different size of the trees and different you know angular combinations so there's still like you know we can do simulations to understand provide more insight but uh, I, there are some insights already provided in, in one of your your work uh in that area but the one that we have here currently the measurements is all linear polarized okay linear so yeah sorry everything is linear here thank you so far you have another question in the chat uh, can this method be applied to sub-saharan region for groundwater resilience and draft studies? 
Uh, I, didn't, uh, I didn't quite understand the question. Yes, me, me either. Uh, this was from uh, Chandra Sharif. Uh, Chandra, can you better uh, explain the question? Uh, because uh, you are speaking about the drafts, so probably, I mean, uh, low water in the vegetation, probably. Yeah. I will say I don't know I didn't quite understand the question, but I think it's it's more related to um, the information about the vegetation water content. So I'm electrical engineer, so I'm more interested in like how do you get this vegetation water content as accurate as possible. So this presentation is about that, like how we can get that information. But there are people um, they're using this information for you know this forest fire risk, hydrological ecological process, which is part of my expertise. Um, but the, this talk is mainly about like how do we how can we get this vegetation water content using this Genesis T technique? Um, so okay. I don't know if this answers the question, but that's that's sort of my answer. Yes, me too. It is not fully clear to me this question. Um any other question or comment? Uh, no, not from this chat, neither from this. And also, uh, no question, seems no question from, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, I, okay. There is something strange with my computer. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, okay. So I think if there are not other questions, uh, uh, I would like to thank all of you for uh, joining this webinar. I hope that it was interesting and that it was very interesting for me because I was also interested in the topic as we did something in the past, but you have done a lot more and especially the idea of moving the receiver under the forest, I think is very nice. The robots are very nice, but also the, the idea from a scientific point of view. And uh, I would like to thank again uh, Mehmet for the presentation, the webinar, and all uh, the, the people who attended.